Hello everyone, let's go ahead and go through sample A. I'm going to be using the same structure for all the samples and all these videos. So starting off with my first test, I have this unsaturation test with bromine water, which is allowing me to test for the presence of alkenes or alkynes, as these will happily react with bromine, which is a light orange yellow color in solution. So if they stay or the test shows that the color stays, that would mean that there is no alkene or alkyne present. So these sort of functional groups are unlikely to be here. Moving on to my next test, which is my oxidation using acidified potassium dichromate. It's a oxidative test. So it's looking for things that can be oxidized. So common functional groups like alcohols, aldehydes, uh, or, or similar are what we're looking for. In this particular case, again, we're seeing this orange color is remaining. Potassium dichromate is an orange solution. And so if it remains, that means it did not oxidize any species. So again, we're just saying there's no alcohol and it's unlikely there's any aldehyde in here either. Lucky last, my carboxylic acid test with sodium, uh, sodium carbonate, apologies. Sodium carbonate is a weak base. If there was something slightly acidic present, we would expect to see a reaction and the production of carbon dioxide gas, which is the result of protonating or acidifying that carbonate. Here we're seeing no carbon dioxide, so we unlikely have a functional group that is acidic, and in particular for course of all the uh, functional groups of interest to you, the carboxylic acid group is unlikely to be there. So we're finding a lot of evidence for functional groups that aren't present so far. Moving into our IR spectroscopy, shown here, we can have a look for some functional groups and see what is or isn't present. I can see at the moment that there's not a lot going on. This peak here, is going to come up in pretty much all of our IR spectrum. It is just carbon hydrogen bonds. So the fact that there are carbon hydrogen bonds in an organic molecule is not overly surprising. Outside of that, I can't really see much of anything. Anything below the 1500 region is what we refer to as the fingerprint region. So for the most part, I'm not going to try and interpret that section. It's very difficult to read and it's unique to every molecule. What I'd be looking for after that would be a very strong signal, nice and sharp about that part of my uh, IR spectrum, or potentially a smooth or complex broad signal about 3300 uh, wave numbers. Neither of those are present. This signal here would have shown me a carbonyl, and this one here would have shown me an alcohol if it was smooth or a carboxylic acid if it was quite rough and complex. Again, neither are shown. So I'm seeing more and more evidence for no obvious functional groups. Before we move on past these original tests in IR, I wanna point out this document that I have open here because I wanna start showing how I would write this if it was for uh, example in an exam. So I'd really quickly say, saturation test was negative, that's the bromine. I would say the oxidation test was negative, so no uh, alcohol or uh, aldehyde. And that my uh, carbonate test was also negative no uh, carboxylic acid. So you could just write these quick notes down as you're going through. As you notice these results, just quickly write them down onto the test paper because they're showing that you have an understanding of what you are seeing. For the IR, I would say no smooth broad OH signal or my sharp, narrow, cut it up.
So in either case, I'm not seeing the alcohol and I'm not seeing the carbonyl. So I'm getting more and more proof that really there's maybe not a lot going on with regards to my functional groups. So at this case, I would start to take a guess. I have an alkane of some description. I have no idea the length of that chain, but simply the absence of all functional groups is really leading to me believe that I've probably just got an alkane chain fully saturated. So it's not an alkene, it's not an alkyne, it's just a not, not a lot going on. But we'll see our further tests to confirm that. With regards to our next test, which is our mass spectrometry, I'm just going to clear my writing off the screen and scroll down a little. And so here we have our mass spec. At the moment, I can see that there is a peak at about 72 as my molecular iron. I can read that off to the left here as well. So I will say that my molecular mass equals 72 grams per mole. What I'm also noticing is that I'm not seeing a one to two, one ratio between two peaks that are two mass units apart. What that tells me is that I'm very unlikely to have bromine present. Bromine exists in two isotopes, 79 and 81, in a one to one ratio. 50% of the time it will be 79, 50% of the time it will be 81. So what that means is that our molecular mass peak, there's actually two likely possibilities and equally likely that are two mass units apart. So here I can only just see one peak, so it's unlikely to be bromine. Similarly, I can say that there's probably not chlorine in here as that has a three to one peak between chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. In this case, 75% of the time it is chlorine 35. So I can use this to say that there's no halide. And in fact, a moment ago, I'm gonna update this slightly. My guess should have been that there was an alkane or an alkyl halide, because none of those other tests would have spotted that either. But now I am saying that there is no halide. One or three to one uh, molecular. can spell really well, there we go. I'm actually getting quite a lot out. And at this point, I can take my second guess. I kind of got there a bit before, but I'm going even better now. So yeah, it's definitely or very likely to be an alkane. Beyond that, I'm not gonna take out anything else from the mass spec at this point. Even that 72, I'm just gonna hold on to that number. It's gonna help me a little bit later. But for the moment, I can't really tell much with it. The only other thing that I can say is that 72 is an even number. Odd, so probably not an amine. The reason I'm bringing this up is because ni uh, nitrogen has a molecular mass of 15. So if it was present, it would be an odd number. Be very careful with that rule. It's not really a rule, but it's a, a guess, a guideline. So if it's not odd, then I don't have a single amine in my molecule of interest. But let's move beyond this now to the far more descriptive, even though we've got a lot of information before we got anywhere near it, uh, NMR spectrum. So here we have our two NMR. I'll come down to the peak data in a moment. We'll start with our carbon NMR. So what can we read off from this? Firstly, I can see that all of my signals have a chemical shift below 40, quite low in a carbon NMR. In that particular case, that would represent that all of the carbons in my molecule are in the alkyl or aliphatic region of the carbon NMR spectrum. And what I mean by that is simple, alkyl chains, I'm just drawing up a few examples of them, hexane, butane, and pentane, just drawn on the screen at the moment, but there's no real functional groups uh, affecting them. There's no electron withdrawing, making them go to a higher chemical shift. So I really am hammering home this idea of that I've got an alkane. So I'd start off by saying zero to 40 ppm, all peaks, 
Next thing that I would note is that there are three of them. So three, uh, I should say signals. So three signals, therefore three chemical environments. So at this stage, we can stop again and we can start adding more guessing. Note that I often do this. I'm, I'm drawing things out as I'm guessing them. I'm writing things on the screen. You can just draw this anywhere on your exam paper. Always put all your working out and all of your rough thinking as you go along. So at this, case, at this point, we can start to ask ourselves, okay, what alkanes could form that would only have three chemical environments? And in fact, we're going to combine this with some data we had earlier, which was the molecular mass. So that's going to help me know that I can't go any heavier than that, but I need to build up a large enough molecule to have three distinct carbon environments as shown in this example. So let's, let's start off with really nice and simple. If I had just methane, that would only have one carbon environment, so it's not going to be methane. If I had ethane, there's actually symmetry down my molecule. So these two carbons on the end of ethane would be identical. And I would still only expect one carbon environment and one carbon signal. Building up to propane. Again, I have symmetry in the molecule. So these two carbons would be the same environment, but this central carbon would be different. Note, of course, that that would be two carbon environments, still not quite there. So let's keep building up. Naturally, this gets a little bit more complex as we go along. I could consider, oh, apologies, one too many carbons there. I could consider butane or its branched equivalent, which is two methyl propane. In both cases, I still have symmetry. Here for butane across this line. So these terminal carbons would be identical. And so would these internal ones to one another. So again, only two carbon environments. For my two methyl propane, all of these terminal carbons here on the end of my molecule are actually identical to one another. So one carbon environment for those three methyl groups. And then a second carbon environment in the center. So still not enough carbon environments to make sense to match this carbon at all. So I'm just gonna clear the screen now. I'm gonna go beyond four carbons to our five carbon system, otherwise known as pentane. Of course, I can have branched examples of this as well. So I'll take one of those and methyl groups and move it in there. So this is the other branch that I could potentially have of pentane. Starting with my linear pentane drawn at the top there. I do have symmetry down the middle of that molecule. So these and carbons are the same. These internal ones are as well. And then I have a unique carbon environment right in the center. So I have three carbon environments. Okay, that, that could work. That is an alkyl chain that could have my three carbon environments. What about our branched example? This is actually a little bit trickier. Not only is there still symmetry, but the symmetry is just within part of the molecule. This can be hard to see. And it's the result of the fact that we can rotate around that single bond. So actually, in fact, this carbon here and this carbon here are in the same chemical environment as one another. After that, we have a second carbon, a third, and then a fourth. So this would actually have four chemical environments. So between these two examples, the linear pentane is the more likely. It has the three carbon environments. If I were then to calculate the molecular mass of pentane, you might be able to guess it would come out as 72. Five carbons with 12 hydrogens, otherwise known as six times 12, which is of course 72. So that is 
showing me very likely at this point that I have pentane. So I don't even need to go to my proton NMR. I've got everything that I would need. In terms of what I would write down, firstly, I would make sure I write the word environments correctly. Then I would state that only near pentane has three carbon environments. Just three at that point. I am not doing well with my spelling of environments today. To draw this as you are writing it on the page to give a feel of it's pentane, it has three environments. But note that I was just drawing them all out until I got to something that made sense and has a molecular mass of 72. So I'm not going to go any further. If I tried to go to hexane, I'm going to get too heavy and it's not going to make sense for this system. One last thing I will look at is my proton NMR, at which point immediately you might cry a little because it looks awful. Often when we show you proton NMR, we show you really nice clean ones where there's clear singlets and doublets and triplets. This is unfortunately the real world and pentane does not come up in those nice clear coupling patterns. Part of the reason for that, in case you are curious, is conformers. So these two are both pentane, just rotated around this single bond. But by allowing for this rotation, I have subtly changed the chemical environments around each hydrogen. So when they do couple with one another, it's not clean. I don't want to unpack that much further than that, simply to say that for longer chained alkanes, which have allowed rotation within them, your proton NMR can come out a lot more, what I refer to as blobs, uh, is technically referred to as multiplets, where you get these sort of signals that you can see here that aren't clear. They're not obviously singlets, doublets, or triplets. So for the most part, trying to interpret them is uh, not going to be easy. You can go down to this data that is given in this particular table down here, and you can say, all right, well, does any of this make sense for what I'm seeing? We can note that there are our peak area ratios and then our numbers of peaks. Let's start with peak area ratios. That's integration. It is the number of hydrogens in a given environment. Just like with our carbon enema, we still have symmetry down here. So we know that these terminal carbons and the resulting hydrogens attached to them are in the same environment. If I look at my peak area ratio, six would make sense as there are six hydrogens on those terminal positions. And if I have a look, number of peaks, it's trying to tell me that if I drew this out and it was nice and clean, I would have what's called a triplet. A triplet implies that what is next door to that must be one less than the number of peaks. So this is the reverse of what's called the N plus one rule. So I'm seeing from the perspective of these hydrogens on the next carbon over, there has to be one less than my number of peaks. So three peaks minus one would tell me there's two hydrogens on the next carbon. And that makes perfect sense. There is. If we draw that out in pentane, that works perfectly. And of course, it's symmetrical. So we would expect to see that. So that makes a lot of sense uh, for that particular integration and splitting. Looking to our next one along, we have a peak, uh, peak area ratio of two. So that implies there's only two protons that are in that environment. That can only be this central carbon and its associated hydrogens. As because of symmetry on the other carbons, you actually have four protons in those environments. So I'm just going to be looking at the uh, highlighted carbon and the hydrogens attached to it. On either side of that, we can currently see that there are these hydrogens we've already identified. There are four of them. So now I'm going to go forward with my N plus one rule. I have four hydrogens either side in the same environment. So I would expect to see N plus one, four plus one or five peaks. 
which I'm seeing here. In case you're curious, that is called a pentet. Lucky last, we have a signal with an integration of four, which are these four hydrogens here. And number of peaks associated with that is six, a sextet. Let's walk backwards here. We've got the number of peaks, six, and going backwards through my n plus one rule. So that implies there's five hydrogens next door to that one carbon over. From the perspective of this carbon, I'm going to purposely highlight. There are three hydrogens and two. So it's surrounded by five on either side. To a first approximation, it is reasonable to consider those all the same. So it's coupling or splitting with five hydrogens, giving me my six peaked result or sextet. So really I've, I've gone ahead and pulled out all that information just to confirm, but it doesn't really tell me anything new. It just makes sure that, yeah, it definitely is pentane. So again, going to my sheet here, what would I write? Well, I point out that my chemical shifts, zero to two ppm, yes. So it shows alkane again, that matches up with what we thought. Outside of that, we can match up the integrations of six would show two times CH3 in this particular case. And uh, that, that is represented by a triplet. Meaning CH2 max uh, or adjacent. So I've just said, look, I know I have two CH3s. I know they're next to two CH2s. Is it likely? End of pentane. Continuing on, we can keep pulling this apart. I could almost, in this case, I'm going to cheat. I can say that there is now an integration of two, which show one time a uh, CH2 signal, shown as a pen tat. No, it's not looking at it all. Let's just ignore it. Uh, and in this particular case, it, that would imply that there are two times CH2 attached adjacent to that. So likely the middle of pentane. And lucky last, we have an integration of four. So we're back to looking at two different systems. Yeah, two times CH2s shown as in this case, a sextet. meaning one times CH2 and one times CH3 attached adjacent, likely middle uh, CH2s between middle CH2 and CH3. Of course, you can just draw this out and point to things that you wanted to explain. But overall, Have and really, as I said earlier, that proton MR, even though I pulled it apart to show how it matched, I didn't need to. I knew it was pentane before I got to the proton NMR. So you don't need to jump to the end. To go through one step at a time, you should be able to figure out the molecule that you are looking at. With that, I'm going to end this video. That is the explanation for um, unknown A.